There is a place of sorrow and love. The innocent. We find that the God is calling His people to be concerned about the vulnerable. And groups of vulnerable people that are mentioned include orphans and widows and, uh, and uh, strangers and the poor. And of course, there is a way in which we could also include the Levites in that category, but because today we are not uh, uh, necessarily talking about those, allow me just to mention uh, you know, the, the, the widows and the orphans. And God indicated in Deuteronomy 10:18 that he is the defender of those widows and orphans. And that if they are oppressed, he would act, and he would do certain things that are not very pleasant among the people of God. And then goes and the orphans and others. The other two years, we of course know that the Levites are um, a, a law that allows those people, those vulnerable people, to be taken care of. And we find God continuously condemning Israelites for not supporting orphans and widows in different, uh, in, in different scriptures. In the New Testament, we find that widows are still part of the vulnerable but, and Jesus actually is involved in ministry that supports widows in many ways. We see him raising their dead. We see him healing their sick. We see him acknowledging their contributions, like the two pennies of the widow. Or even using them as an example, like he, he does in, the, in talking about the, the widow, in a parable about the widow uh, facing um, uh, some sort of injustice and the uh, having had to be very persistent. And so, Jesus, uh, uh, Jesus cares for the widows, and then we see here that the, the new church, the early church, continues to also do the commandments according to the way it was in the Old Testament. So, First Timothy chapter 5, 3, 3 to 16, we find that that whole passage is committed to the care of widows and also some advices on how uh, widows themselves should behave themselves. But the main uh, point I want to say is that the church, the early church, was expected to take care of the widows. And it had to begin from family. So families are told to take care of their widows and then uh, the church was also to take care of the older widows. So, we find ourselves more than 2,000 after, more than 2,000 years after the resurrection of Christ, in a situation where we still have the vulnerable, we still have the, the poor, the needy, the orphans, the widows, and the word of God still remains relevant. That we are supposed to be actively involved in helping them. So, like daughters, we are called upon to abound in good works, in charity, and in kindness. Like daughters, we are called upon to do it continuously. Relief is good, but relief can only provide support for a time of crisis. It may not change lives. And so that continuity, it, it, it has to do with transforming lives. God has called us to be co-workers with him. We are talented and we can be able to live fruitfully. I want to give an example with myself because I was told, part of the reason I was told to speak on Dorcas or Tabitha, it's because of the ministries that uh, God has allowed me to do. You have heard, some of you have heard my testimony, how we, I grew up in a very, very needy family in the Aslam uh, area in Kiambu. And we were poor indeed. If you want to read more, you can read a book I have written about my story. It is called Against All Odds, Rising from Humble Beginnings. That book is available in the library. Somebody came yesterday saying, I have been looking for that book, but it has been borrowed and borrowed, and they are not able to get access. I have two copies there. I probably may add more, but it's also available on Amazon. And 
It is a story of how I grew up in poverty. If there is anything that I know, is that there is an enemy. And now that I have never met the devil himself, life, life, I can tell you one of the biggest enemies of my life and that I live to fight is the enemy called poverty. Because I have tasted some of its grips and it is not easy. And then later, my, uh, at nine years, my father died. At 21, my mother died. And when my mother died, I was left with nine, I'm sorry, with the three uh, siblings to take care of. And uh, it was not easy as a teen, as a, an adolescent, or okay, a young adult, but I was still in college, to be left with the adolescents uh, and the one child to take care of. And it was very difficult. I, I had to depend on scripture because God says he is father, he is a father to the fatherless. God has been faithful and I document how God was faithful in bringing me from that background to where I am. I'm thankful for scholarship opportunities because here I got some scholarships when I came as a student uh, uh, from the community church from CLA, my interest I think that time was not uh, working with the AIU, but uh, with the next, and if it was, I didn't know about it. But I got those scholarships. But there is one that really touched me, because it came from a person, and she was a woman. And I told myself, I would like to see myself grow out of dependency. I would like to grow from being scholarship to giving scholarships. And I have watched with a lot of pain a lot of people who have benefited from scholarship. Many years after they have graduated, they still are in that dependent mode. We have many alumni at ARU, and somebody would actually be thinking, our alumni are positioned in great places of influence. Maybe AIU should not be struggling financially like we have been. But to be very honest, many of AIU graduates or next graduates benefited from scholarships. And they acquired this mentality that there are some wazoos that help. There are some uh, Wazungus, that is what we used to say to uh, some boys, you know, some people, some donors overseas. And many people have not grown to see themselves as supporters. And therefore, we continue to depend on the West even many years after we graduate. We want, and what happens is, okay, we want us to be supported for a PhD, we also want to be supported with our children, you know. Just look at people who have become dependents. They also want to be supported for children. And so the support continues now for, for children and grandchildren. When will we ever grow to be supporters? Now, because of time, I'm not able to tell you the whole story. But by God's grace, I have been able to start several schools. One school is in Madan North area. It is called Tumaini Academy. To my academy is in Ruaka district. If you look at the records of Kenya, that school is number one, has been number one for three years in Ruaka constituency. Uh, it is dropped number two last year. We are getting back there. That school, we started with 13 children in 2003, and today it has over 400 children. By God's grace, because of what we saw in that slum context, HIV and AIDS being a problem, orphans, widows, I, I started several things. Uh, part of them are women groups that uh, do big works. Uh, but then one of the key ones that remains is a children's home called By Grace Children's Home. And at By Grace Children's Home, which we which uh, we started in 2005 with my husband. Today we have 101 children and, under our care. Then we started uh, a school to
to be to be able to help those children and also the community. So by grace, primary school has now 250 children. <laughs> Last year, we produced the best child, the best candidate in Kajiado West County. <laughs> and later, I started uh, by Grace High School, which currently has about 100 children. I am not able to say much, but I want us to ask ourselves. I didn't begin that because of being so extraordinary. I have been a very normal person just trying to discern needs in society. In fact, even those efforts did not begin as organizations, as responses. The registering of organizations came because now we could not do the work illegally. Because you don't just pick children and leave as if they do not belong to a nation. And so it was not the organization, it was responding to needs. I can tell you so many organizations that do what I do today, but their motivation, it was not in response to need, it was in response to money. Can I tell you how? A missionary came. Uh, somebody out there came who was passionate to help society. So need was desperate, was crying. But somebody here was not seeing that need. I, I, I'm, I don't have time to really explain what I mean, but there are some people who now say, yeah, we can do something, because this person was willing to give money. And I have seen so many children's home closed down because they were influenced because money was present. So when money went, they also closed shop. And I've also seen others that still continue because streams of money continue. And they, some of them actually, they have transformed the lives of the founders because the, the, the ministries have become cash cows. By grace, we started in our house we left our house to rent. We gave that house to the children's home and brought in people to work. For three and a half years, we used our salary, went into a lot of debt. We knew it would not be sustainable that way, and therefore we started telling people to come in and support us. Today, we do not earn from by grace. That is why I work here because I do not want to burden by grace. There are some people who, do, who have done what I have done, and they are big CEOs, earning a lot of money. But I do not choose to go that way, at least in the meantime. And if, if when, when it happens, there must be a structure that allows that to happen, that makes it not pull from the resources of by grace. Ministries are not, to be, are not supposed to be cash cows. We give. Sometimes I'm writing to accounts. Can you please take some money to pay fees for my children? Because we have 14 children who are students here. Some of my children are here. Please stand. <laughs> so if there is, there is one person that can be transformed because of your ministry, do it. The one person matters, and that is what God is calling us to. It is not big numbers. There are so many opportunities, even here at ALU. If you, if, if you recall, just two weeks ago, we had students here who were going to be leaders, and they told us they are manifestos. They had big, big dreams. I'm wondering, if you lost that leadership, what will you do now with your manifesto? Are you going to sit and wait until next year uh, where you can again renew your manifesto and give us? I want to challenge you to let it not stop there. Implement your manifesto because there are other opportunities like clubs. I am not going to sit and wait for students that will be brought by marketing department. I will have to make sure every year I have enough students that can make my salary. I thought I would be here longer to explain to you in detail how
how I do it. But every year, I account for my salary. Because I don't want to sit. Thank you. I don't want to sit and just teach these students and I can tell them I need the demands. I, I can tell these students they're not paying. So I have to do something. I have to do things that add value to this institution. If we can have vision and mission and do it, I'm telling you, we are not going to be looking for jobs because there will be a lot of work we are generating, we will be generating jobs. Let's abound in good works. Let, let's abound in charity. Let me read finally uh, First Peter uh, chapter. Amen. Sorry, chapter First Peter. Is it Second Peter? <laughs> now I lose it. Uh, Second Peter chapter two, from verse five to nine. Uh, sorry for the rush, but I think it is a blessing of visitors. Just continue, continue. We have uh, the scripture there. Okay, but let me read Second Peter. Chapter 2, verses 5 to 9. And besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue, knowledge, and to knowledge, temperance, and to temperance, patience, and to patience, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they will make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that loves these things is blind and cannot see afar off, has forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Let's do it. Let's live extraordinary lives for our God. Show me, show me what you see. Illuminate what's right in front of me. Whisper.